<laughs> we'll uh we'll do part four of prayer and we'll finish up. I don't know if we're gonna get to all of it. It's quite a lot. Eight? Well, yeah, eight actually with the back. Um so we'll have maybe we'll have to split this up, but um we'll do the other half of the other table of the Lord's Prayer, uh the thighs, um uh in the uh God's caring for us in this life and what we pray for, but we'll open out. Let's open up with prayer with Psalm 46 here. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Psalm 46. Uh, Fitting for the day is the psalm for Reformation Day, but it's also what uh, Luther bases a mighty fortress off of. Um, and you can kind of see the elements of that in there. Um, and maybe it's an appropriate psalm, too, as we uh, teeter on the edge of Election Day and all of the uncertainties and uh, anxieties that that brings for a great many people in our nation. That the... The Lord is the one who uh, sits enthroned um, and rules the earth, regardless of what man may do. So even in spite of people's uh, obsession with wickedness in Halloween, too, or evil things, or maybe not even an obsession, but maybe a desensitate, they're desensitized to violent things. So... Maybe think like, uh, what would our ancestors say if they walked the streets uh, on Halloween and they saw all of these horrific things? Um, doesn't mean Halloween isn't redeemable as a Christian holiday, which it is. But um, last year when we took the kids trick-or-treating, there was a house in town where the guys, I told you that, they came out with like chainsaws and they were, they were, I mean, Deliberately, and this is what they were trying to do, scare the kids. I'm sure in fun, Mary was pretty scared. Um, but interesting how that type of thing is, you know, if that happened outside of Halloween, somebody probably would have gotten shot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yikes. Luther writes on prayer and using the Lord's Prayer. He, he writes a book called The Simple Way to Pray. Uh, I've got it in my office if you're interested in it. Um, essentially, he walks through how to pray using the Lord's Prayer, but also using the Creed and the Ten Commandments. But Luther writes, I do not bind myself to the exact words and syllables. He's talking about the Lord's Prayer. But I do stick as close as I can to these kinds of thoughts and the meanings of each petition in the Lord's Prayer. It often happens that I get lost in right and good thoughts as they come, so that I do not even say the rest of the Lord's Prayer. When such rich thoughts come, just let other prayers go and give these thoughts plenty of room. Do not in any way hinder them, for it is this way that the Holy Spirit is preaching to you. His sermon is better than a thousand of our prayers. And and maybe that's the point when we talk about praying the Lord's Prayer and praying these things in the Lord's words, that, that we should get lost in thoughts about those words. Um, and that the, the point is not even particularly to stick syllable and exact word 
but the thoughts that uh, and the meanings that these things put across. So it's meditating in in a in a very Christian sense on the Word of the Lord, meditating on His petitions and the Lord's Prayer, the, the way our Lord Jesus has taught us, um, and uh, ruminating. We talked about that yesterday. Ruminating um, on God's Word that it fills your mind with these things and it leads to other holy and righteous thoughts. And that is the spirit at work in you, um, thinking about them. Um, so we'll look at the second table of the Lord's Prayer, provision in this life, and we'll walk through prayers and give examples of those things and what they actually mean when we pray these things. We talked about uh, the first through third petition, but now we'll talk about God's providing for us in this life. The fourth petition, give us uh, this day our daily bread, and from the small catechism, what does this mean? God certainly gives daily bread to everyone without our prayers, even to all evil people. But we pray in this petition that God would lead us to realize this and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. There's the point, thanksgiving. It's in fact, it's not as if God is not doing these things already to you, but to be reminded of them and to know the hand by which uh, you are cared for. And so then in the small catechism, what is meant by daily bread? Uh, the short answer would be everything. But daily bread includes everything that has to do with the support and needs of the body, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, a devout husband and wife, devout children, devout workers, devout and faithful rulers, good government, good weather, peace, health, self-control, good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbors, and the like. And uh, the, the psalm that you could quote to support these things and praying for them, or really Psalm 145 is one that demonstrates that the Lord is actually caring for you in all things. So not just in your faith or in, in maybe in a spiritual sense, but in a physical sense as well. Um, and the psalmist writes, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. And you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. And this is actually used in the small catechism for a blessing. Sometimes you hear it. We say it when we bless a meal here at church um, or maybe sometimes at home. But in the small catechism, it gives um, several different prayers as examples of things, morning and evening prayer. Uh asking a blessing before meals and asking a blessing after or giving thanks after a meal is is uh, eaten. I don't think we do that. I've only seen a few people actually do that in their lives in a daily practice. Um, maybe that's a good thing. I, I, I think about that with my own children. Um, often they eat and gobble up the food and some gobble faster than others. And... Uh, <laughs> Then they, you know, or not eat, or not eat. Yeah, well, we go two extremes depending on on how big your family is and how the kids are. But um, and then they run off, and you think perhaps we should take a moment and give thanks for what we had just uh, gobbled up in that instance. Um, maybe, maybe here's a good idea to incorporate that. Maybe we'll start doing that, and we'll start with our midweek Advent meals. So we'll ask the Lord's blessing and the prayer before we eat our Advent meal before on midweek services. And then when we're done, we'll ask the Lord. And that might be an excellent way to encourage people to meander into the church for evening prayer. Um, as as opposed to ringing bells or uh, bored. Staring. Staring, yeah. I'll, vested, staring at the door into the fellowship hall. <laughs> Right. Uh, but yeah, we get that in, in the catechism. It says the children and members of the household shall go to the table reverently. We can only wish. Fold their hands and say, the eyes of all uh, look to you, O Lord, and you give them their food at the proper time. Or sometimes we say in due season. Uh, and you open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. And then uh, shall be said the Lord's prayer. And then the following, Lord God, Heavenly Father, bless us in these your gifts, 
which we receive from your bountiful goodness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I don't think, a lot of Lutherans don't say the the prayer for table blessings that way. Usually it's come Lord Jesus, be our guests, and let these gifts to us be blessed, uh, which is fine as well. And again, Luther is not prescribing in the small catechism like, you have to pray this. Um, he's just giving examples for people um, and giving examples so that you don't have to make things up. Some people maybe would never pray unless they're given an example of what to pray for, even how to do it. Um, so he does that. When I was a kid, we played, prayed the common heathen prayer. Look out lips, look out gums, look out stomach, here it comes. Right. That lacked the reverence that... Uh, Rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. Amen. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, you could do that as well. Um, uh, uh, well, I mean, you make a good point, John. So you think you call it the heathen prayer, but even um, even people who aren't Christian have some kind of innate sense of giving thanks for what is there. What are they being thankful for? Maybe in part the hands that had provided this, but you know, ultimately, uh, I think there is a thought of something is giving them this food, and it's not just of their own hands. And a lot of it, they're okay with saying it's Mother Earth that provides it. Right. Yeah. I mean, they then they go full pagan and trying to get the Mother Earth or the universe or whatever the case may be. So, so what's the focus in this petition? The focus is recognizing God as the giver of all things and giving thanks for all his gifts of creation that sustain our body. Really, the focus of it is the first article of the creed. I believe in God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth. Um, and so uh, that he does make all things and gives them to me. He, he even does that to the wicked as well. We'll see that in some of the scripture verses here. Uh, but that um, uh, perhaps that's more important now than we, we've uh, realized before, <laughs> because, you know, often the food that we get doesn't come by our own hands of the earth, but comes from the supermarket. So I think we've, we've talked about that before. Sometimes when we, uh, if you pull the things from your own garden or from your own animals that you have to slaughter, you, you see a time that's been used uh, your own time to get that, or that you are reliant upon things like rain um, and things that happen in proper times and due seasons, and um, that some seasons are more abundant than others. But if you go to the store, then maybe you have a, a closer sense of forgetting that stuff uh, because it's just right there provided for you. I think that does make the difference with meat too, meat products. I mean, if you have to kill your own animal in order to eat it, you've witnessed that something has sacrificed itself for your own sustenance. So and you got to see that? Yeah, and you should give thanks for it. Um, oftentimes we come disassociated with that. It's chicken. Right, yeah. So then maybe at church, I we always say maybe during Holy Week we'll slaughter a lamb and uh, traumatize the children <laughs> and uh, and then eat it after the, the divine service on Dang. Easter Sunday. Yeah. Or you can name it supper or something like that. Yeah. I think that's what they do with um, uh, an Eastern culture too, Eastern Christian culture and Greek culture and, and Orthodox culture. They do that. Huh? Yeah. They'll go a goat or a lamb or something like that. And they'll, they'll slaughter it. Um, and, they'll eat it. and they eat it. Yeah. Often with lemon. Uh, so the takeaway from our daily bread, then, is everything that we need to support this life. If we don't get that, then we die. And so since these things are important, then we should take, and we, why do we take them for granted? And we don't express gratitude for them. Um, Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 5. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Um, or Acts chapter 17 in him we live and move and have our bre uh, being or James chapter 4 you ought to say if it is the Lord's will 
we will live and do this or that. Uh, or Psalm 106, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever, which is actually throughout, not just in Psalm 106, but throughout uh, the Old Testament. Or Paul says in Ephesians 5, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's good to give thanks. Um, and it's good to give thanks in our fourth petition prayers, praying to the Lord that he does provide us and that he will provide those things. Um, maybe then thinking too in prayer that often needs um, make us draw to the Lord in prayer. But um, uh, when we have those needs satisfied, do we give thanks often in it we will at, at church here when we observe the harvest and we do our uh, church thanksgiving uh, we'll give thanks to the lord and i think i said this before we get the best there's two got there's two gospel readings two readings you could do for thanksgiving one is a thanksgiving day reading which is uh the 10 lepers you know one turns back and gives thanks that's fine and then the alternate would be observance of the harvest where jesus tells the parable about a rich man who has everything he needs he builds a bigger barns to store all of his stuff and he says to himself i'm well satisfied in my soul because of what i've done and then the lord kills him that night and says what is all your stuff now to you it's nothing um and uh that's maybe the better one because in great abundance we can we can fall into this calamity or temptation to think that all of this is of my hand. This is why Jesus says, you know, it's it's uh, harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not because they're rich is being bad, but because if you have everything you need and you provide those things to yourself, you have a temptation to think it's all me and not so much the Lord who gives and takes away. Or you could curse the Lord when He does take them away. So. That could be money or children or anything like that. Family, house, home, all those. Health. Yep. Health, for sure, right? So if we want to pray this in the Psalms, we could pray it in Psalm 104. And I, I broke it up a little bit because Psalm 104 is quite long, but it's one of those Psalms of creation. And you can hear these things in the fourth uh, petition of the Lord's Prayer, giving us our daily bread. You can hear this in the Psalm. Bless the Lord, O my soul. <laughs> These all look to you to give them their food in due season. Think of what we just said. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. So you can see the elements of that in the Psalms of praying the fourth petition. And again, that goes back to uh, prayers of the church have always been, that's all right, and historically been the, the Psalms. So uh, now we move on to the fifth petition. Uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us or forgive us our debts. And from the small catechism, what does this mean? We pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look at our sins or deny our prayer because of them. We are neither worthy of the things for which we pray, nor have we deserved them. But we ask that he would give them all to us by grace. For we daily sin much and surely deserve nothing but punishment. So we too will sincerely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. In Proverbs 28, verse 13 does a good job of describing this, right? He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. 
Or in Psalm 19, who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. In other words, there are no hidden things, but the Lord sees all and knows all. And so what do we ask in this petition? What are we praying for in this petition? We ask that our Father in heaven would, for Christ's sake, graciously forgive our sins. Um, and we think of Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love or your steadfast love or your loving kindness. According to your great compa compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, or Psalm 130, if you, O Lord, keep a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Or Luke 18, right? This is the, the prayer of uh, blind Bartimaeus, right? God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, so we think uh, praying to the Lord, praying for forgiveness is one of those things that... Um, the Lord desires from us. In fact, it makes me think, I've told this story before, but they had a guy um, come to, this is probably three years ago now, come to the high school and give a presentation. They do like motivational speakers and stuff like that. And so this guy came and I didn't know anything about him because he was pseudo Christian when he, whatever he spoke to the high school. So I looked him up and he has a podcast, which I think everyone does at this point. And um, he has a he has a podcast. He's having a conversation with someone and they're not they're evangelical loosely, but he's talking about prayer. And he's like, well, prayer, he goes, is, you know, I'm just having a conversation with God in a very friendly manner. So he would say, I'm praying to God like I'm talking to my friend. And you think, oh, that's fine. And what he said was. He goes, God probably gets annoyed if you're always on your knees and begging for forgiveness. If someone, if my friend came to me and was every, every five minutes, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I would be annoyed with that. And then you think, oh, it's the devil. So <laughs> I don't know how you sat there still. I would be... So, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, Ugh. it, and, and that is an indication of what, um, uh, I mean, I th I would say that's probably very typical for people in their Christianity because they do not know what the Lord wills for them in their life, nor that they know his word. They may know catchphrases and they may know case studies of certain things, kind of like they have a a, sun, a, a children's Sunday school understanding of scripture and and not so much an understanding that, you know, the Lord constantly asks you um, to call upon him um, so that he can have mercy on you and that you are, in fact, I mean, some of that is a recognition that perhaps this guy thinks that we don't sin daily or or much uh, very often, or he holds an understanding of grace to be very cheap as if, well, you know, God justified me in Christ. I'm sure he would say that, but perhaps that's something I look at as I'm driving away. It's like in the rear view mirror of my car. Um, as opposed to something that is the forefront of everything. So forgiving us our trespasses, uh, forgiving us our sins is what the Lord desires to give to us always. It's always before us. Um, and that uh, we, we should be in constant prayer asking the Lord to have mercy on us. Um, because I think what would be annoying would be the fact that uh, you believe you're forgiven. If you want to go to this friendly sort of understanding of prayer, uh, if my friend continuously sinned against me, then that would be more annoying than someone who was constantly repenting and uh, in so believing those things, keeping and knowing how offensive that sin is to run from it as opposed to, well, you know, I just keep doing these wicked things over and over again. Um, he sacrificed his son. Yeah, so you, for that particular purpose, and if we don't acknowledge the purpose for which his son sacrificed, then what good is the sacrifice? Yeah, or and we don't keep that as the forefront. I mean, we've talked about this before. Like the cross is the epicenter of all of everything, right? So all life flows from the cross, and so it's forgiving everything 
after the fall, it's forgiving everything into the unto eternity. And the realization of that is, I mean, even in a new heavens and a new earth, everything is perfected and given a perfected righteousness because of Christ. So it's even more than what occurs in the garden um, before Adam and Eve fall, that we live in eternity in the perfected righteousness of Christ fully realized in us and in this world at the banishment and destruction of everything that is evil. Um, and I would say that's what Christ is getting at in the Lord's Prayer too. I mean, this is why the end, when we get to the seventh petition, if we get to it, because it's a long, a lot of paper here, <laughs> then, um, then he says, you know, deliver us from evil or the evil one. So, um, so why do we include a prayer for forgiveness of sins and these peti petitions to our Heavenly Father? I mean, we're not worthy of these things for which we pray. We don't deserve them. And uh, we therefore need God's forgiveness so that we may pray to him confidently and in good conscience. So, uh, you know, I, I think it, it goes back to this reality of, you know, I, I tend to have an understanding of God and how he treats me by the experiences or emotions that I feel. So if I'm feeling down, then perhaps God is not, uh, loves me as much. Or if I'm having a bad day, perhaps he's not as loving to me as much. But the reality is uh, we still can come to him in prayer despite all of these things that we see around us because God has made us a promise and forgiven us. So he hears our prayers for the sake of Christ. Um, in the large catechism, Luther says, where the heart is not right with God, it will never dare to pray. A confident and joyful heart will come only from the knowledge that our sins are forgiven, that we can approach him with great confidence and boldness, right? We see that in Genesis 32, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown to your servant. Or we see that in Psalm 32, um, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin or the iniquity of my sin. You can see parts of the liturgy come out in that too, right? We say that in, in, uh, in confession and absolution. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I think that's something that's foreign too. When you talk about mainline or mainstream Christianity, um, one that isn't necessarily scripturally liturgical that um there isn't often in an evangelical service an under a confession or absolution at all certainly not an absolution but there's certainly no confession of sin that happens in there i mean unless i'm mistaken most evangelical services are you know a welcome three songs maybe a scripture reading if you're lucky a message a prayer and a closing song that's usually the pretty so is it safe to say that their idea of worship is more for praise and glory that they're just praising god and glory and they're really not uh accepting this the the gifts that god gave them i mean well yeah i would say yeah things. no i i get yeah you're right yeah absolutely and i i would say it's it's uh it's a narrow focused um understanding and and again i mean just like we've talked about before with worship I mean, the tendency, even in the word worship, has now been sort of manipulated to think that we offer things to God and and we're doing a work. I mean, uh, Roman Catholics would would label liturgy as the work of the people. And um, I don't really think that's necessarily a fullest understanding of what that is. Right. I mean, it's a response. Right. And that's always what I mean. And we could see this in constant scriptural pass passages, too. I mean, that's pretty much the whole Bible that God is doing and people respond. God is doing and people respond. People are wicked. God responds. He does something. He's merciful, too. They respond to that. So, um, and and there should be a sacrifice of praise. I mean, that would be your life as a Christian. And I think... Um, uh, that's part of it, but an acknowledgement that that you are in fact unworthy of those things, that God is actually forgiving your sins and is still and constantly, it makes you aware of your sin even in the first place. So sin becomes something that's sort of like, well, it becomes, sin becomes less 
in a mainline or mainstream Christianity, it becomes less about offenses to a righteous and holy God that are forgiven in Christ Jesus that happened all the time. And they become sins become um, very horizontal in the fact they become life advice. So you get things like, well, a sermon becomes more like life coaching. You want a better life? Well, here's what God says. And, you know, seven rules for a better marriage or, you know, eight rules for living your best life now or whatever the case may be. As opposed to, you know, God is transforming you and you actually don't deserve any of it. In fact, you know, Christ is the one who mounts your cross and gets into your tomb, but he also rises in your new life now and lives eternal just like you will. So um, I, I think there's a difference there uh, that's pr pretty fundamental, especially when you talk about prayer. So what does it show when we forgive others then? And so uh, it shows that we truly believe that God has forgiven us. Um, and the large catechism, Luther says, in so much as, um, as we sin greatly against God every day, and yet he forgives uh, it all through grace, we must always forgive our neighbor who does us harm, violence, injustice, and bears malice towards us. Uh, if you do not forgive, do you think that God forgives you? Um, and uh, you can see at the top of page four there, Matthew 6, right? And again, Jesus is talking about this in the Lord's Prayer. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And, um, you know, if we want to get some really big, broad biblical narratives that fit into that. I mean, the easiest ones would be Joseph forgiving his brothers who had done quite wickedly, and he could have easily enacted revenge against that, but he doesn't in Genesis 50. Or what we just had in the gospel reading for this past Sunday from Matthew 18, the unmerciful uh, servant. Um, and again, I mean, it's not to say... Um, that God is like, you know, I, I think maybe we always think about things from a top-down perspective to say, well, I need to forgive people so that God forgives me. Well, the case is God has forgiven you. Like, that is the reality. And so that should change. It changes you and everything in this life um, so that now you carry that with you. He's created you a new heart so that you do actually have the capacity to go out and forgive. Um and uh, because the reality is, I mean, just like the unmerciful servant, right, going out and choking um, the next servant who owed him a hundred denarii, which, by the way, when you think about 10,000 talents is what the king forgives him, and he goes out and chokes some dude out for a, a hundred denarii, the difference of that is immense. Like, again, a hundred thousand is the highest uh uh, numeration they had for stuff in Greek when you talk about money. And so it would be like, you know, uh, one talent would be like a whole day, a whole year's wages. So you're thinking 10,000 years, he would never be able to repay that, even though it's interesting that he says, give me more time. But he says, give me more time. And it's pointless. Like, it's stupid. You're never going to be able to do that. And so the king forgives this insurmountable debt i wonder what he was buying or how do you how do you how do you rack up that that debt to get like that right but it's just a parable and then he goes out and chokes out the servant for 100 denarii which is chump change i mean compared to um it's nothing um so yeah i mean that's the thing it changes our perspective on everything um and so we can forgive trespasses because we've been forgiven entirely in christ um, and that forgiveness applies to us even when we are not deserving of it. Um, in fact, we don't deserve of it at all. Um, but that's probably the hardest thing. Um, I don't know if we pray those things, though. I mean, we sure, we would pray them in church. Maybe that's a good thing about having a liturgy, too, because it forces us to pray about them and to think about them. But if we're left to our own accord, we think about praying to the Lord to give us a heart to forgive those who have sinned against us, that's a difficult thing. Um, 
that might be more troubling. Um, we're certainly happy to ask the Lord to forgive us, but, you know, and that's really true when you think about people, especially your enemy. So most people are, you know, I'm inclined to forgive my friend because I like them. But what about the people I really just don't like at all? How do I forgive them? Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, praying this in the Psalms, we could hear all this come out in, in praying Psalm 5. Um, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning, give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice, in the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness, evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes, you hate all evildoers, you destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down to your holy temple in fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out. They have rebelled against you. But let all who take refu refuge in you, who uh, rejoice, let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. Um, I think it's important to point out that the those who turn to the Lord, those who turn into forgiveness, are given that, but those who do not are given up unto their own self-destruction. Um, essentially, the Lord gives them what they want. I mean, those who are not inclined to the Lord to receive forgiveness for him, he gives them what exactly they desire, which is an absence of him, an absence of his forgiveness and righteousness, and that ends ultimately in destruction. Um, so we think about those, the Lord forgives us, but also that the Lord forgives those who come to us and seek a forgiveness and a repentance for us. Um, and then maybe that's important to point out because you think about even with the parable of the unmerciful servant, that the beginning of it is with Peter asking Jesus, my brother comes to me, you know, uh, how often should I forgive them? And it's, you know, 70 times seven. But his brother is coming to him for forgiveness. So there is a difference between those who are unrepentant, that the Lord would call them into repentance, but that they are, you know, that he would in fact exact judgment upon that those who do wicked but those who turn he gives grace and mercy um it's good to point that out because um when it, there is repentance that has to take place and um it happens even in the church if we were God forbid ever one day to excommunicate someone from this church to cast them out. That it is a loving thing to do because they are exiled and they are, are exiled from the grace of God and that God has passed a judgment on that, but that in that exile, they would seek to return. Just like you think about the prodigal son, he comes back to the father. Um, even though the father is always out looking, um, he's not going where the pig food's at to find him. In the sixth petition, lead us not into temptation. Maybe this is the hardest one um, in the in the Lord's Prayer to understand. The small catechism says, what does this mean? God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature will not deceive us or mislead us into false belief despair, and other great shame and vice. Although we are attacked by 
these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory. So you think at the top of page five, what uh, what do tempt and temptation mean in Scripture? And in Scripture, these words have two meanings. Uh, when you think about testing our faith, uh, which God uses to bring us closer to him, perhaps that could be more of a temptation, or uh, since God tempts no one, uh, a parasimos, right? A trial, a calamity, a, a, an affliction um, that God uses those as a trial to bring us into a greater faith. Think about what James says, tempering or testing. Um, John chapter six, Jesus says, you know, when, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy uh, bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. But he already knew, he already had in mind what he was going to do. Or in James chapter 1, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Uh, so, I mean, the Lord does test his people. Um, he does temper them, which it, it goes back to the understanding of refining the, the impurities of metal. Um, of burning those things out. Isaiah has a uh, good way of saying that in which the Lord uses fire and, and a hammer for his people. Um, and that's how you temper metal to make it, in fact, much stronger if you're building a sword or you're doing some kind of metal work. Um, and you get those biblical narratives of the Lord testing Abraham by commanding him to sacrifice Isaac or the uh, Jesus tested the faith of the Canaanite woman um, who uh, who is uh, persistent. She perseveres through that. There, uh, the negative aspect of tempt would be and temptation would be that the attempts of our spiritual enemies to lure us away from God and His ways. So, if you want to think about temptation, or the Lord is uh, uh, deliver us from temptation, the two understandings would be. God tests his people to bring them closer to him. <clears throat> Our spiritual enemies lure us away, tempt us away from God. So it's all about a directional thing. Um, and the word tempt there, uh, pirazzo, very similar to the word temptation, but it's to try and test. I mean, you could interchange those two um, uh, as well. Mark Mark 14, Jesus says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Or, and again, James chapter 1, when tempted, uh, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. <clears throat> but each one is tempted when he, by his own evil desires, is dragged away and enticed. So the difference then between testing and tempting um, that the Lord would test us um, and that he would refine us. And I think that's more in line with what we've talked about before in hallowing God's name and that his will and his kingdom come, um, that the Lord would refine us so that we would, uh, you know, truly live a life that is worthy of the, of the holy name that is placed up upon us, the great sacrifice that's given in our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but that we're also praying that the Lord would keep evil things away from us um, that might lure us away from God. And that can be a great many things, um, especially in this modern life. Anything that tries to supplant, right? Anything that would say become an idol. So I trust something more than God. And the reality is he's going to destroy all those things that we trust in, in tempering us and making us stronger money, uh, sports. Uh, I mean, it could also be family, our own abilities, uh, our, you know, knowledge or anything like that. He will um, break those if we trust and fear and love them more than we actually love the Lord. Um, 
And I, I mean, I could go back to we talk about, I don't know, it makes me think about when we, we were just talking about Halloween before you before you got here and how there's a there's a difference in the wholesomeness of Halloween and it it's been progressive. It's not like it's just like, oh, we woke up this morning and now people are, you know, uh, putting uh, was I saw fictitious dead bodies in body bags in in the yard, you know, like that's I don't uh, that's wicked. I don't know why we would celebrate. What would that. you celebrate? Why right. would you celebrate? Right. Um, and got the idea of Halloween mixed up with horror. Mm -hmm. just... Yeah. Yeah, they they kind of increase that. Yeah, actually, you make a good point, Amy. I, I would agree because. If you drive out here on the way back to uh, where my house is at, you notice that house that's off to the corner, they project horror movie of several scenes from different horror movies onto their house. That's their Halloween decorations, right? Now, keep in mind, I don't know how anyone's supposed to see that because I don't, you'd have to stop in the road to look at it. They have a, you said. They have a projector. Do? oh yeah and they're projecting it on the side of their house when you come down and stop at the stop sign and they're different scenes from different horror movies is that the house with the things on the porch no the expecting... no that's a different one so i'm talking about the one that's right here on the corner oh. yeah that one has that whatever that is big big uh team attack. The house, the one that's on the corner before right we're... yes yeah they're projecting scenes from California. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Now I want you to think about this. Number one, that's illegal. You cannot display a movie for public consumption. So they're 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 playing movies where everybody can see it. Yeah. And they're playing a movie that's likely rated not for Mary Ellen. That's true. So they're broadcasting. They're, and they got little kids. They put something on the side of their house that you have to talk to your kids about if they see it. Right. Well, I, I think it, it opens up a discussion that should be had about opening yourself up. There's one thing to say, Lord, keep our spiritual enemies away from us, like protect us from that. And he does. It's another thing to go, well, I'm I'm going to go and run out and meet the enemy and see him and maybe invite him back to my house. And then when uh, he's in my house and things happen calamities or destruction i'm going to go lord you didn't take care of me in this even though i've invited this thing into my home so um oh my gosh we just had that conversation joe and i she was playing a game video game or with her friends and, and it was but i blew up but and i probably didn't handle it the proper way but she was playing a game um where it involved demons and demonic possession yeah and I told her, I said, dude, well, she suffers from nightmares to begin with. We have, in my family, it's it's like a long spiritual battle, it seems like, with, with us. But, so she has nightmares, spiritual nightmares, on top of it. Mm -hmm. And and I told her, I said, Joe, I said, you know, zombies and aliens, you know, if you want to shoot a zombie, if you want to shoot an alien, okay, I can maybe go with that, but not. I'm not happy about it, but when you play a game that involves demonic possession, I said, you're opening the doorway. Yeah. I said, it's the same as you putting a Ouija board down. Yeah. You're opening the doorway to things that, yeah. and I said, you can't you can't say that it's not going to happen. Yeah. Because you don't know what Satan's capable of. Right. Uh, none of us do, really. Well, and you, and you don't want to put yourself in a vulnerable position, so... Um, yeah, I mean, video games, uh, you know, probably this is unpopular, not here, but for some groups of people, like, I really don't think, um, if, if somebody says, well, video games makes no, they make no difference in how Thank kids you. think about things that is garbage, that's not true. And that's a cope. You're just going to cope on the fact that you want to play them and you don't want to have these things taken away or you don't want to have the realization because you like them. But to play very violent things, you know, I don't think it doesn't have the same effect of going out and committing that violence, but it does. When we talk about Halloween, desensitize you to the constant sort of bombardment of it. And just the same thing with television and movies, you know. I, we make that argument about sexual things to, to keep those, I mean, you, you want to, 
you don't want to expose your eyes to those things because they do desensitize you and they entice you in a, in a great many things. And that's all over media. But the same thing's true about violent. And you think, well, people are now more hyper aggressive than they've ever been. Huh. Well, I wonder where that comes from. You and know, you got to tell your kids that it's wrong. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you and you should be guarded about. I mean, again, I, I think not just with Halloween, but you allow, I mean, all of us, and I'm included, we have a television, allow this thing to come into our house. And it should be, I mean, I wouldn't let Jeffrey Dahmer walk in, right? I would hope not. Yeah. But what about if I'm watching a show with my kids that's about, I mean, there's a, there's a TV show, right? About Jeffrey Dahmer, I think. Yeah. And like, you know, I wouldn't allow that to come into my house in a physical sense, then you shouldn't allow it to come into your home in a spiritual sense. Right. So it doesn't mean the television should be thrown in the trash. I don't agree with that because there's there's things that can be seen and there's edifying stuff. I mean, Rice is right. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, what's interesting you know? about video games, Pastor, you talked about the point that people say, oh, well, they're just playing games. It, it won't affect them in any way. I remember when they when Atari first came out, and I had Atari. People talk. They said, "Oh, this is good training. This is good hand hand eye coordination training for the military and things like oh, that." Oh yeah, sure. So I mean, they they acknowledged at the time that there that it was a training. What practice. was the movie where the guy? Maybe it was a guy or kid, and he plays war uh, games. No, he's playing on the arcade, and it's like Space Invaders, and then alien ships show up. And they recruit him because he's good at being. Oh, the last Starfighter. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, last Starfighter. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> they probably didn't watch. Oh, that yeah, was yeah. I mean, that's what. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't watch those things. I was more Scooby Doo and Bugs Bunny. Well, okay, and here's the other thing: when you talk about inter education, entertainment, stuff like that. There was another movie that came out right around the same time, and it was called Enemy Mine. Hmm. And in the movie, it had Dennis Quaid starring as an American kind of astronaut. He gets stranded on this planet with this creature-looking thing that's played by Lou Gossett Jr. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they're enemies. They become friends. But something happens. The alien guy is actually pregnant with a baby. With an alien baby. Yeah. And so they develop this friendship, and then it becomes this guy, you know, this human's mission when he dies to protect this child. Okay. That was in the movies that they were, you know, pushing out. That, that is yeah, weird. It's very strange. That's weird. I, um, well, I mean, I think the, the thing is with video games, uh, it does create something. I mean, if, I mean, if you, I mean, they've done studies before. If people's heart rates are elevated watching the 1960s Batman, then your heart rate and your mind is a little bit changed uh, when you watch these violent things or play these violent things that are on uh, games and, and television, um, you know, and that's in a separate argument from uh, they, the kids become obsessive. You want to act it out yourself. As a, as a yeah. Yeah. That was the argument. I mean, you think about people made with cartoons a long time ago where they saw violent things on cartoons. And that means the kids are going to go out right. and do I never uh, thought of anything violence with my and, Bugs Bunny or and and that was yeah and that was the argument that people made well that's not true but okay so fine you take that in just one segment and it's not a problem yeah. but then if kids are being inculcated with violence all the time so you see it on the TV you play it in the games right and then it bleeds over into real life and in fact the culture then becomes hyper aggressive way more aggressive well there's a catalyst for that and you know some of that i think is well most definitely media that people allow these things i mean i remember uh extended family nobody here extended family going to their house uh perhaps it was in new jersey and watching they were watching like the walking dead or something like that and their kids who were like five or six were there watching it too and i'm thinking that can't be good for them. They go to bed and dream about it. You know? Well, it becomes normalized. Yeah. And so then, you know, they see these things and it, it's like a psyop almost. Yeah. Um, they, they never 
dreamt about it because I'll tell you what, the minute you dream about stuff like that, it scares the holy bejesus out of you and you're, you're done. You don't watch that stuff ever again. Yeah. I watch me. Well, you think about how people react. Think about how people react now to crime that occurs to them firsthand. I mean, it's not happening here, but if you were in New York City or you're in Chicago and somebody was getting beat down or robbed, I think the first instant would be people would do this. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say Right. And they want to video it. And as opposed to they view it as not a real reality in which something is taking place and someone is being hurt, but that's something that I can view through a media. Or perhaps make some money if I. If or they could make fun. money. Yeah. I mean, I. I yeah. Somebody's getting a beat and, and you see this video of this person getting beat. What about the person that's holding them? Can they not walk in there and interfere? And help? Right. Yeah, and help. The yeah. culture has changed because if you think about, I mean, this is like too much media now. I remember the last episode of Seinfeld where they they fly to, they're in like Massachusetts or Connecticut or something like that where they have to stop off and they witness uh, a heavy set guy being uh, robbed, mugged on the street. And they have a video camera and they video it. And there's a law that was enacted about a good Samaritan law where they're not helping them. And they have a trial and they bring back all the characters from the show and stuff like that. But now that is, in fact, the norm that the, the understanding of I'm going to be a good Samaritan and go and help someone uh, who's being attacked it becomes the norm by which people do record a bunch of things. They can make money or they desire to post them all over the place and they don't interact with that in, in any way. Yeah. Content. Yeah. They want to be creators of content as opposed to people. And the real the reality is they're not creators of anything. They're voyeurs who happen to be in the yeah. place that they need to be. That's all they are. And the, and so they, they build this idea, oh, I'm a content creator. Really? No, you're not. You're nothing. You're an observer and you happen to put these things online. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you become consumed by the thing by which you watch all the time in that you become some consumed by it that you become it. I become a, a, a now the means by which I broadcast that stuff. When you think anybody who watched bum fights or something like that, there's, right. no, there's no redeeming. No, nothing at all. To, you know. Nope. Um, and that's like the norm now. I mean, uh, so. Um, all right. Let's we'll wrap up with this. What do you uh, what do we ask God to do for us when we pray this petition? We ask our Father in heaven to give us strength to resist and overcome temptation. Right. And Jesus says this to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked uh, to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fa fail. Right. Or Romans 13, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires uh, of the sinful nature. Um, or 1 Corinthians 10, if you think you are standing firm, this is the best one here, when Paul addresses this, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you, do, that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except that is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand uh, up under it. He gives you his word, but don't think that you are somehow immune to these things. And that's what Paul is getting at, that you can go and participate in for the church in Corinth in these pagan activities and think, well, it's not going to affect me, lest you fall. And so you should be careful about those things. Um, and then Ephesians 6, right? Put on the floor, my God, take your stand against the, the, the devil's schemes, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we can see those things. Um, and uh, there's a few biblical narratives, but you can see that most, especially in Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, right? He doesn't give in to the temptation of Satan, but in fact, rebukes it with the word of God. He does the will of God and he knows it. Um, and he's prepared uh, in a very real temptation that Satan gives to him. That to be honest with you, if we were tempted this way, we would probably, um, certainly fail. we would certainly fail. Yeah. Um, let's close. We'll close. We're not going to get to the seventh petition, but we'll close with praying Psalm 66. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let your our feet slip. For you, God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. 
You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride out over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out in a place of abundance. In Jesus' name, amen.